Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul, and I'm delighted again to be able to speak to accomplished fund manager Richard Penny of Crooks Asset Management. So welcome, Richard. Thank you, and good morning. Yeah, well, we had a ton of really important macro data last week, uh, interest rate decisions from the uh, Bank of um, England, um, the Federal Reserve and the uh, the Bank of Japan all on uh, hold and all alongside sort of softer than expected UK CPI data. So putting all that together, Richard, what's your sort of outlook for uh, equities, particularly in your sort of like your special sort of small and mid caps? Yeah, small and mid cap UK. I mean, small caps outperformed through the cycle two and a half percent. We've been through that part of the cycle with rates going up where they haven't outperformed. People forget about the potential for our performance. We've had 32 months of outflows in the UK, and you know, people are fed up of us talking about value. But I think when we get interest rate cuts, will be value with momentum. And that is usually when you get really strong returns out of small cap. In fact, somebody at uh, another fund management house done the numbers and said, you know, we've now got to the point where the five year returns in small cap are, are down to zero. And normally when you get that, um, I so actually the down years or the last two years have taken away the recovery we got from COVID. Usually when you've had that and they do the numbers back to 1955 and all these things, you get, um, you know, very strong returns over one, three and five years. And, if, you know, there's all sorts of these kind of numbers, but um, just value versus momentum. It's just a very easy trade for people buy NVIDIA. Of course, all the directors are selling all the big, you know, US stocks, and we're getting bids for the UK stocks. That yeah. that kind of tells you that we're in the right place. And the, the other thing, which is a big indicator, I've never seen quite as many RNSs saying stock buybacks. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, one of the features of um, a market where we've had redemptions 32 months is um, if the cash goes out of the market, um, those buybacks to some extent are upsetting, and that's helpful, but also the bids um kind of i think it's about five billion somebody did the numbers and mm. you know every day we seem to, every other, other day we seem to get one um that that is now part of the reason why the market is a little bit better in in not just mid but small and micro um in in 2024 and yeah. the buybacks because um you know it's just a really good use of cash i mean a lot of the shares are incredibly cheap it's a bit similar to the to to companies been bought in the UK market. The external players sort of see the UK as cheap and they see the assets as cheap and they can issue paper or use their cash to, to buy UK assets. And the same is true of private equity as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's another flag that there's optimism out there. And just to sort of like, there's a lot of investors like me and you who sort of specialize in sort of small and mid caps who are feeling particularly depressed and battered, particularly at the start of the year with portfolios down. But looking at the sort of difference between small and large caps in terms of in small caps you seem to get sort of like um greater volatility and greater periods of sort of you know less less liquidity and stuff but can you just talk through this what you what your thoughts are in generating sort of beta and alpha because over the very long term you know if you pick wisely it, it, you know, there are a lot of stats that seem to sort of imply that you can do well out of small caps to generate that extra alpha yeah, small caps develop markets, 2.5% per annum. If you go, this is that with the bottom 10% by market cap, you go to the bottom two, you kind of get 4%, obviously very cyclical. So the way that people behave in a downturn is they, they go into the large stocks, the defensive ones, the ones with lots of cash flow, probably not in the cycle. Small, small and mid caps are overweight cyclicals. Um, we started to see some recovery from October last year in the mid caps. We haven't really seen too much of that in the small caps. But that is kind of also the playbook in that people will buy the bigger stuff, which maybe has, you know, quite useful double digit, 20, 30, 40% upside before they'll buy some of the small caps, which, I mean, when we do some examples, there are stuff that yeah. has got 50, 100% upside. So the small caps, they get oversold in a downturn. Um, they therefore offer more upside if we get a cyclical recovery, which should be triggered by interest rates. But it does happen a little bit after the mid caps. Yeah. 
Okay, good. Well, let's go to some sort of stocks because um, you've certainly sort of picked a few good winners, actually. You've got one spatial that over the last sort of three or four years actually has been a really sort of consistent performer. It's a sort of specialist software business in geospatial. And I think it's made a couple of quite good sort of announcements re recently, one in sort of like software for traffic management in the UK. And it's also got an emergency services uh, sort of like fledgling software business out in the States. But it's core is in basically doing sort of like geospatial data cleansing validation for utilities and um, you know companies that need to understand better their sort of like plant out in the field. I think you've, you've kind of done it. I mean, it's Cambridge based. It's been clever technology. It's been that for a while. That that it's the ability to take a database and and for it to be spatial, so it, it understands how things interrelate is important. Um, they are, as you say, winning the 911 contracts in the US, which I think the business keep the business going reasonably. I think the historic business is is probably a little bit cheap at 50 or 60p, maybe vulnerable to a bid by a US company. But the interesting thing and where people will find data from the recent central markets days, the one street works. Um, this has been some time uh, in development. I think it's cost them about five million pounds to date. Um, but they have you know, it is now in rollout. So that they announced the first customer, which I think is United Utilities, and there's a, there's a multitude of other uh, proof of concepts. They identify it's a 400 million opportunity, which is number of jobs times 100 pounds per job. And they would like, yeah, I'm sure they would like to get 40 million in revenue over, you know, I guess a three to five year period of time, which is 10% market penetration. So basically, Given the functionality of the historic product, it enables people to schedule um, street works, sort of yeah. digging holes in the road more efficiently. So rather than make, yeah, and it's really quite an onerous thing to do, you have to get approval off the local authorities. So rather than blocking off a whole one mile stretch of um, road, potentially with this, because it's more efficient, you might be able to section it down into a hundred yards and so alleviate some of the traffic problems but it saves a lot of money for the for the the people that are using the utility companies and you know if they could get very high drop through margins on this it, it will change the equity story so it would you know if they were to get 10 or 15 million of uh annual recurring revenue it would, it would be a huge delta to the to the profits yeah well, I have to ask you a favour here, actually, Richard. Next time you speak to the CEO, Claire Milverton, can you can you tell her to put the software out down Bromsgrove because there's so much traffic works down the A38 where I do at school, right? That it's it's a traffic yeah. jam every single time. So this will be a good use case there, good reference example. Okay, well, let's move on to another one. We've got some um, advanced DV, uh, uh, sorry, DVT with uh, Vin Murray, who's a bit of a force of nature as the exec chairman in sort of software. Can you take us through where she's doing? Because I know when we last spoke, she had a chunk of cash and she was deploying it. I think she just bought the Capita software business. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I think we have figures on Thursday of this week. So the Capita business has been bought. It was managed like a number of businesses in Capita for an exit. So I think it's been bought well. There were four divisions. And, you know, it's performing okay doing... 15% EBITDA margins. I, I think the expectation is you can get those to 25% on maybe three or four years. And, and this, to remind you, has deployed 25% of the money raised. So that there are other deals that can happen that may be positive. But um, to get the margins from 15 to 25%, um, you know, you'd think you might have to sell a lot of new product and or take costs out. I think at a recent investor event, I think it was Mellow, there was chat that a lot of the software has been underpriced. So this is a sign of the mismanagement. And obviously, if you can put prices up to existing customers, and there's hope of that, um, you know, that's that's a relatively quicker win. So it may be less than three or four years. It might be two to three years or, or even quicker. So, you know, if you're charging somebody hundred thousand pounds for something that's mission critical and you can charge them two hundred thousand it, it drops through pretty quick and obviously it's quite a lengthy job to get them to do that not everybody will do it but i think there's a there's a degree of optimism yeah and uh i mean given uh vin's background in all things software yeah. then she knows the price sensitivity presumably of these uh products so she yeah be sensitive yeah. to it yeah i think it's similar to what happened with a business called ad astra which was part of 
advanced computer software, which was a previous one that did very well for people. Mm. Um, you know, the shares about one pound twenty. They they they've recovered from the lows of eighty two p, but you know the money was raised at a pound. Um, as I say, the seventy five p is still sitting in shares and cash, so potentially they can be part of decent deals. Um, if you get to ten or twelve times EBITDA on what they've bought, that would take you to. 150 to 165 pence they're 120 today yeah and also in the context of what we discussed just before that we thought the 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 businesses that you know the stocks then there'll be uh there'll be lots of opportunities in the small cap software sector that she can uh put the uh redeploy the funds okay good well, well, yeah yeah good okay well let's move to another one which actually has metamorphosized we've got uh pinewood technology which used to be the old former um pen dragon the car distribution uh, distributor but um has spun off into just a software business for sort of like dealer management software can you take us through what you're seeing here because i think it's got a big dividend coming out to shareholders of 24.5 p soon yeah i mean we we're sort of looking at it on the on, on the basis after that um so it was historically very easy, very interesting business. Um, dealer management software in the UK, there are two or three players that have not invested a lot in the product. Um, but Pendragon uh, owning Pinewood were not really able to access some of the bigger corporate groups because they're competitors. So they have got a 25% market share in small uh, one and two site operators, which is still pretty good. It's a cloud-based product. It's, it's sort of absolutely up there. And now that uh, the motor distribution business has been sold, there is obviously the potential to sell to these other people. And in recent meetings, um, actually that potential, that, that potential is actually quite near term. So market share should go up. It's got really strong operating metrics in terms of EBITDA margins, return on capital. And there's a big opportunity. The company that bought uh, Pen the Pendragon motor business, Lithia, it wants to take it into the US where the price per seat is three or four times as big. Now that might take a bit of cost, it might take a bit longer. But if you add it all up, it, it's it's sort of capable of doing 15 to 20 percent growth at really strong return on capital. Hmm. What's the and, and I haven't really spoken to the management before. What were the management team like? Because obviously they're they're new to the public arena, I presume, given they've just been spun out yeah. at Pen Dragon. Yeah, they come across very well. I mean, you know, I think they see this as a new opportunity unleashed from from a business where they couldn't necessarily sell to some of the biggest clients, particularly in the UK. Um, and, you know, they're just sort of very into dealer management software and all the modules for people to sell the cars and, um, and how that works. And it's a global business. They, they, they have business in Japan. I understand they're quite well with Porsche and things like that. Potentially, there would be acquisitions maybe for some of the <clears throat> Northern European territories, but um, yeah, it's relatively unknown. Market cap will be sort of over a hundred, um, probably mm. remain fully listed, I think. Yeah. Um, but it's just, it's exactly the sort of business people like. So mm. uh, you know, very high margins, high return on capital and growth. So um, I think it will get a strong following. Yeah, and if and if the shares do go down, then I'll bet your private equity will pick it up because it's a simpler business now, isn't it? <laughs> Rather than uh... yeah, the, the the US metrics are a lot higher, as with most of the things yeah. that we look at and we'll discuss. But yeah. because it's a global business, and yeah, I think I think that that is quite likely to happen. Okay, good. Well, I was the three stocks which have done pretty well recently. One which hasn't done so, quite so well is FD Technologies, which is basically a bit of a sort of a hybrid. It, it's a it's an IT specialist, sort of stroke soft software specialist for the capital markets. It's got a real crown jewel KX Insights that does essentially um, it helps AI within the um, uh, or real mass real time data processing, which is a, an AI default essentially for the capital markets, and also trying to branch out. And then it's got a big consultancy business, which was its core uh, F, it's, which is the first derivatives. And I think it's now de trying to demerge or has demerged its marketing stroke sales lead business MRP. Can you take us through this one because it came out with a bit of a profit warning, but to perfectly honest, not massively surprising given. You've had Accenture also having a profit warning, and you've had FDM also having a profit warning. Just saying, a lot. There's, they're seeing sales cycles in this whole corporate IT spend pushing out if it isn't related to to AI. Yeah, we've we've had a number of meetings with the business, and we're quite happy to reassess the, the you know the investment case. But central to this, and people could look at a central market stay in October, is is the fact that technology does something unique and. Mm -hmm. 
you know, tie-ups they have with people like Snowflake, um, they're presenting at the NVIDIA conference last week, uh, Databricks, Microsoft, AWS. If they have they have those because other people can't do it. And you're right that they are able to process data very quickly. And the market has been difficult. Sales cycles have been more difficult. But I think to some extent, um, the company may well have uh, focused a bit too much on new clients. But um, I was very reassured that there's some, there's some pretty big wins. There may not be quick big wins, but there will be big numbers in the defense market and the financial services market where they've historically been. Because... And also interesting in that is that there are companies out there in the US like Palantir, which is on mm. 30 times sales and Pinecone, which is a little vector database business, which is in many ways is less robust than what uh, KX can do in vector databases. Yeah, I'm pretty enthused that the technology is still totally relevant. They just need to um, focus on the best sales prospects. And I think they'll do that. So historically they had... 350 million revenue target for 2028. Well, that's just over optimistic. And, you know, if, if they're going to do that, it'll be 2030 or 2032, but uh, from about 80 million today. But it is a business of size. It's valued about twice revenue when you take out the consulting business. And as discussed, you know, just the US comps are on, well, venture companies like Fine Meadow are valued at hundreds of millions. and Palantir is on 30 times sales. So the prize is big. The prize is still valid. Execution needs to be a bit better, but I'm, I'm relatively enthused that they will get there. Yeah. And will they demerge the um, the first derivatives consultancy business from the KX Insights? Because they've obviously done that first leg and got and decided to push the MRP business in with a, another private, similar, similar private business, I think. Yeah, the, the, the statement in October they were reviewing it and they've gone a bit more definitive in saying that they've considered selling it now. So whether or not that means it's a formal sale process, I think I think they may well have moved more down that route. Mm. Okay, good. Well, let's move to another one. In uh, healthcare, we've got Couth, which does sort of mental health services. And frankly, this is just you know, a really urgent area for the world, essentially, in terms of not just... I think Couth specialise out of the NHS for school uh, mental health um software um and services and support and stuff like that and then there's won a couple of really big contracts out in the states one with pennsylvania which is trying to just finalize and but the big one is in california where it did a, a big fund can you take us through your latest thoughts on this one because i mean it 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 seems to be very much applicable not just obviously for schools and 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 um uh, higher education but also actually for corporates and uh and, and you know adults as well yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, historically, it was the data that came from the NHS, and it it was just making a small EBITDA, but not a great cash profit. Mm. Against 450 companies, they won the California state, which is a 188 million dollar contract. And 450 rivals they beat. <laughs> yeah, they beat. I, think, I understand they beat isn't it? people like Google and things like that. So, I mean, the exact issue here is that given what it is and given how it be valued in places like America, it's it's just far too low valuation. I think we'll have figures in the next couple of days. I suspect the the UK and the nature of these things will be, you know, struggling around government deficits and things. But I mean I suspect it'll be fine. California they're they're rolling out that they they've just got the service live. And I think just politically there, uh whilst if you go digging around on the internet you can see that they are um, potentially in places like Kansas and Illinois and New York. Uh, they just need to make sure that they keep um, California happy. So we might be in that phase where uh, people just want a bit more from Pennsylvania and places like that, and I think the budget has been ratified to do it. Uh, I don't know whether they will get that tomorrow. I think they think they have to announce those things as and when they happen. But, uh, you know, you'd fully expect throughout the rest of this year that um, having addressed California, they could start to look at other places. And, of course, once you've built an app using fairly unique data, um, then the next deployments you do are going to be far better financially. And, you know, there's no problems with the existing finances, but um, the, the first job is, is, is to scale up from a relatively small UK company into this big contract. Yeah. 
I mean, it is a massive market, no doubt about it. And if we can get another industry champion in the, sort of like a, you know, a big area like this over the world, then uh, it's about time, to be perfectly honest, because it'll be, it'll be great to see it. Okay, well, and we're turning to another one, which is breaking new ground, is Creo Medical, which is it's sort of like been on the market for some time in electrical, um, surgical sort of like uh, keyhole procedure equipment. But it's one sort of like it's done a lot of R&D and won some uh, contracts or some agreements with with the likes of intuitive um, uh, surgical, I think, out in the States, a really big robotics um, medical devices company. And what I think what it does essentially is is help surgeons do keyhole surgery better using essentially um you know electric so for healing and for um for sealing and stuff can you take us through your latest on this one because they do seem to be moving it's got they've got a new product or new set of range of products haven't they they do they do so the latest new news here is a product called speedboat so it goes down an endoscope you can actually feed it down through it and you can put and seal at the other end which all sounds a bit macabre but Actually, because you can do it, if you see that there's a problem in sort of lower bowel or something like that, then you can do that procedure there and then, saving time and cost. And they're reckoning it saves about £5,000 per procedure within the NHS. Um, there's, again, there's a very good central market stay. I think it was done last October, November, um, certainly Q4 last year. And you'll see the data now. Um, the company... There were a lot of people that really liked this business and when the shares were £2.50. COVID was a problem for them and they, they had to raise money at 20p and we, we got involved there. They're now, I think they're 36 or 37. Yeah. They are definitely rolling out the product. There's talk that they are a preferred supplier to the NHS. There's talk of a, a NICE, NICE mm. approval. Who knows when these things happen. Um, and there's also multiple technologies. So you've got lower, you've got the bowel, lesions but there's there's inoperable diseases like um lung cancer pancreatic cancer where they're doing stuff and you mentioned intuitive surgery surgical yeah. which is valued at over 100 billion dollars now some of the things that creo valued at sort of a thousand for that can do is extend the usage of the surgical robots because um it's it just adds functionality which is unique um um, from from the professor who, who, who invented it, um, that you know the ability to expand expand the usage of the robots um, must have huge value. You'd think to intuitive surgical at some point. Mm -hmm. so, the, so I guess the case is is sort of keeping the business independent long enough that if it were to be bought by intuitive surgical or another U.S. corporate, um, the price is the right one. Yeah. So, so essentially, and from my understanding, they say the speedboat goes down the inside of a tube for an endoscope. So, previously, I've had an endoscopy myself, and it just had a camera. All it was was a camera, and if there was a if there was a problem, they'd tell you about it, and then you'd have to sort it out afterwards. So, you can sort it out at the time. Yeah, and I think I think at the central market day, if if you if you're really keen, you'd be able to see all, all sorts of varieties of pictures down people's bowels and types right. of lesions that they can then do, and. Um, there are benefits to doing it because you can potentially yeah. get the whole, you, you can get the whole of, of a problem and if it's cancerous you take it away yeah uh, and because the geometry is better there's less bowel perforations which involve expensive further treatment and in some cases death mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of better and cheaper and why wouldn't people use it but it's you know these markets are conservative it takes time to convert them, but but these it is a breakthrough technology and it is potentially very valuable. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm waiting for the colostomy. Uh, sorry, not the the, uh, the the colonoscopy as well. I suppose <laughs> <laughs> that might be a bit more painful. I, I imagine. Okay, I, I did actually just I did um, see that um, you're sort of interested in in Cartera as well, which is I think is an Aquis stock in in sort of the healthcare space. It's a bit smaller. Yeah, it's a small position on a. Uh, Crooks UK Smaller Companies Fund. Um, interestingly, in December, they announced that they had an agreement with Marino, which is part of ANS Watson's, um, for a functional um, skin cream, basically, which obviously, skin cream is obviously a big, big market. You don't want small AM or indeed Aquis companies going out and doing the marketing, but Marino. AS, AS Watson is pretty much the biggest boots-like company in the world. 
mm. uh, a lot in the Far East, and it's going to be launched in Europe. Announcement this morning that actually the initial order should be doubled, and there was so the, the original functionality here was it was a therapeutic company where there was skill set about getting active products through the skin layer. And in this instance, they've actually used that to get, I think uh, it's vitamin B, niacinamide through. And so they can offer up to three times the level of um, of that active than, than the leading brands, which is very, very expensive. So um, there was demand pull for this product from, uh, from Marino, we understand. And the, the announcement this morning was that uh, the initial small order will be twice as big as it was thought. And then... The follow-on order is five times as big as that. So it's probably very high gross margin. For a little £10 million company, it's potentially quite transformational. Obviously, you've got to see whether people are going to queue up to pay the kind of prices people pay for skin creams for for this product. But I'm sure that uh, Marino and Watson's will be keen to market it in store. Good. Okay. Well, I'm sure investors will can do a bit of investigation on that one. Another one which yeah. has got sort of like skills in sort of reformulating existing uh, therapeutics into other sort of like, you know, formats, et cetera, is Aracor Therapeutics, which I think is doing a similar sort of thing with um, di uh, diabetes. It's using sort of insulin and making it sort of like super concentrated and fast acting. Uh, and then it's also got a number of, it's got a platform, Aristat, that I think allows you know uh, existing um uh, biopharmaceutical companies to uh, to say transfer or transform those treatments into different formats so you might want to take a i don't know an injection into a tablet format um and i didn't under i did see that it's actually got a nice little contract with lily as well which was quite interesting but um, i don't know whether that's on the glp ones taking a injection into a tablet yeah format, which, is, which is they yeah. want to but yeah there's a lot going on but, but basically um it started off in Unilever and it was a formulation business of Unilever and it's been spun out and they have a variety of products. The two, the two lead ones are around insulin, which would make insulin, um, it's to do with how rapidly it acts within the blood. And because it's a potentially a very fast acting, uh, candidate, you should get results from this in the next few weeks. Don't know whether it work or not, but if, Potentially, it's, it's huge because there's potential to use that with electronics and to have a feedback loop between uh, sugar levels and deploying the insulin. And you're right, there, there is a hope to formulate a GLP, uh, which would get rid of some of um, the side effects of the, exist the existing drugs. And obviously, they have been a massive uh, factor for the market. And, you know, yeah. yeah, and if they could actually get it such that yeah, because there's a big um, requirement, ideally, to go from injections into tablet format, ultimately for uh, GLPs, which would, uh, you know, that that's not impossible. Yeah, yeah, potentially it would make it a lot easier to use and administer. Um, you get better conformity in these kind of things. So I think that's a, it's on a one to two year project, but obviously it's potentially huge. The the two insulin ones are pretty big, but they've also done a biosimilar, which is a bit like a generic for, for a pretty big drug recently and that's that's starting to take off so they've got a number of things that are starting to work for them um which should start driving through the revenues probably needs a little bit more money at some point but um but there is the potential for for signatures around um around the, around the fast acting insulin at some point yeah i would highlight to investors there's a bit of a uh should we say a warfare going on in GLP one? So any any company, small company operating in this area with promising data gets bought up by Novo Nortist or uh, Eli Lilly, and there's been a catalogue of them about six because they want to protect their position. So uh, if they have something, then uh, in the next sort of two to three years, then expect a bid. But uh, that'd be my take on it. Okay, well let's move different sectors. Go to uh, technology. We've got. Uh, uh, B B A T M Advance. Uh, they, I think used to call it Batman sort of twenty years ago. It, 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 was a darling, it was a darling of the sort of like uh, the dot com boom. It's split into three divisions. We've got networking arm, which is its core. It's got so uh, cyber security and also medical diagnostics, which I think is a distribution business. But can you take us through how you see this in terms of a sum of the parts, or you know what yeah. was attracted to what was attracted it to you? It, it is a sum of the parts argument. It's a bit misunderstood. 
let's let's be clear it's based in israel so there's a reason why the shares could have yeah. sold off to about the 20p mark yeah but the businesses are spread around the globe so some of them are obviously centered in Aviv, but others not all of them are um what's kind of misunderstood about the business is that there are some very profitable bits paying for the bits that are really interesting but loss making mm. so and the business has not come and asked people for money all the time which you know often you get very exciting projects but they kind of need to raise money all the time and that is really not what you want in this market so at the core is a business called Telco Systems and and, and there's a profitable actually diagnostics manufacturing business that does 6 to 8 million of EBITDA growing quite nicely they've got 40 million dollars of cash uh, they've got some non-core businesses and i think this is quite important because historically they're very good at generating ip but not necessarily commercializing it or focusing and there's a new management and a new sort of strategy to focus on it and maybe sell some of the non-core bits so if i add up all the bits that are either cash generating now or the cash or the non-core cash generating businesses you get to 24p which is a bit above the 20p but the three really interesting bits that some people think could be the market cap um each um are getting funded by these so the first one would be a business called agility which is part of the telco systems business there's a lot of excitement about this two or three years ago there's um joint ventures with arm and vodafone and people like this it's basically it's a software platform for um edge computing internet of things type platforms um it is rolling out they're they're rolling it out with uh 911 customers uh, sort of us emergency services city fiber semex but there's another sort of 10 or 15 trials which could bring them 1 to 15 million dollars of annual recurring revenue and if people are interested in this the central markets day um which i think was june of last year there are slides on all of these businesses yeah. really quite interesting and they have people like Vodafone still and Nvidia on the customer list now i don't know how high tech it is with Nvidia they might just be a, a small customer of it but certainly there is the potential for this to become quite nicely profitable so that's agility and they've spent 35 million dollars on this so i I, I can get to 40, 40 pence, including the, the core cash generative businesses and these businesses if I value that one at cost, which is the 35. There's a cyber business, which is actually doing better because of the problems in the Middle East. Uh, their main customer is, um, I believe, is the Israeli Defense Ministry, but it's encryption and there is the real scope to take that to other um, governments and to expand it into such as the financial services market. So that's a profitable business. Uh, I kind of think it's worth maybe 20 to $30 million today. It's kind of quite focused on the one client, but if they start signing other clients, which potentially could be a lot bigger, potentially that could be really valuable. And actually the chief exec thought that that was currently the most interesting business. And then I got a business called Ador or ADOR, which they've spent 14, where they value at 14 million, I think they spent more on it. It is a technology that you would use in a doctor's office where if somebody had a respiratory disease or a hospital acquired um, infection, you would take a blood sample, you'd get a pretty fast um, readout in sort of while, whilst the patient is there. That's important so they can get the right treatment. It, you know, a lot of diagnostics sound like they're like that, but it's this ability to differentiate between multiple uh causes of disease and differentiate it um it is quite unique and um in the central markets though they compare it to businesses like Cepheid and uh biofire which was bought by biomeria for 400 million dollars Cepheid was bought for 4 billion by danaher these, these were later stage businesses but potentially this is something you could sell and i think you on 14 million dollars you get tens of millions you might just get a little bit more than that but it kind of you we will get readouts on that i think later this year and i think they possibly would be able to sell it yeah so shares are sort of 20p um there's nice cash generative bits it's well enough funded and there's there's two or three interesting bits that you know at very low valuations would get you up to 40p but potentially could be a lot more than that when 
when people get excited about small caps again. Good. Okay, well, that's definitely something to look forward to, a bit of an unbundling play. Now, I've got another one which was, was a darling back in the dot-com, so we're talking nearly 25 years ago. It was IQE, which does sort of like a, a semiconductor wafer, uh, manufactures them in, in the UK. And uh, well, what sort of like, why is the market now going to sort of like, you know, give it a decent valuation and it's going to grow, et cetera? I know it came out with a trading update and it hit its expectations in, in in the second half, but they were lowered expectations. I think it's slightly profitable, but it is a tough industry, the semi. It is, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's massive been, scale. It's been capital intensive over 20, 25 years. It's promised a lot and hasn't always delivered you know, against the long-term vision, but it's been very cyclical. 60 to 70 pence of every pound drops through. Mm. Um, we have seen pretty much one of the worst um, semiconductor cycles because people got themselves very overstocked when they couldn't when they couldn't get yeah. products. They ordered too much, and then we saw a bit of a downturn, and there were no orders for some period of time. The SIA, the silicon semiconductor industry data, has been improving. And you're right, the January statement was... I mean, you know, there's a bit of nerves around it, but it was relatively reassuring. But at 21p, the shares are pretty low compared to where they've historically been. And there is a new management team, which kind of, whilst there is this cyclical upswing we might get, there is the potential for the for the peak to be quite a bit higher if they can land more long-term contracts. And the, the guy, Americo Lemos, who arrived there, there was a very aggressive and expansive Again, central markets day that people could look at in, uh, I think it was October of 22, you know, talking about, I think, $650 million of sales and $200 million of EBITDA. Well, um, you know, with the downturn we've had, everybody's forgotten about that. But clearly they thought that that was possible at the time. Now, if, if any of that or the recovery that may come were to emerge, you're looking at one of the potentially best cyclicals out there. And the, the chief exec, is he's got 10 million shares. Well, I think he's bought and paid for those in the 21p. I think he might have paid more than that for some of them and less for others. But uh, there's skin in the game. Yeah. Yeah, I guess he, you want soul in the game as well, don't you? But uh, yeah. <laughs> with the... With the with I with IQE, one thing which is sort of confused to quite a few, or you know, sort of bit scratching people's heads, investor scratch, is just the gross margins at sixteen percent. It just seems if it's an if it has an IP, then how come the gross margins are so you know sort of like you know, yeah, I think the volumes the volumes and gross margins go up. I think it's a question of where you strike the gross margins. Right. The conversations we've had with people suggest that the drop through margin is more like sixty or seventy percent on the marginal pound. Right. Okay, good. Okay, well, let's move now to the consumer. And one area that has done really well for you, well, you and the business is a hostel world, which has sort of benefited from revenge travel spending, I think, for the last two years. And it's sort of like a specialized um, booking service for hostels around the world. And I guess you've had lots of sort of like, you know, not only students and uh, and people who want to go to sort of like in the hostels after the pandemic, but also you've had quite a few families, I think, who have also wanted a cheaper option and gone to different places. Can you take us through your, your latest thoughts on this? Because actually the shares have recovered pretty strongly. They have. I mean, it's an improving story around COVID, but there's, there's a bigger subtlety, which is um, they're adding social media to it. It's, it's, it's a niche. It's sort of the chief exec came from Expedia. But it's about hostels, and um, so it's less of a family thing. It's more probably youth, probably lone travellers. Right. And they've added social media fact, um, features, which enable people to sort of see who would be there, meet up with people when they get there, um, see events that are available. And basically, that's tweaking the economics so that um, you would get potentially a lower cost of acquisition, but also better lifetime value. And that's what we saw on last week's figures. Um, I think they decided not to pay the dividend. I think the shares come off a bit, but I think they're up a bit this year anyway. Um, but potentially what's happening is the lifetime value and the cost of acquisition is a lot better. So your return on capital, your growth path, that what you can afford to reinvest and grow in the business uh, will just enter onto a sort of much stronger curve and you know it should be a better share. Really. Yeah, I mean, that whole sort of travel sector has definitely done well. As I think... Expedia and um, is it Booking.com and all these kind of guys have uh, have recovered as well. So uh, and I, looking looking at the forward bookings for holidays this year, then I can't believe it's going to do badly in 2024 either. 
No, and it's a younger market. So, you know, younger younger guys, they're, they're, they're students that have got, you know, jobs, part-time jobs that mm-hmm. they like to benefit from rises in the minimum wage. Um, and there's, you know, there's quite a lot of job availability for, for younger people, I think. Yeah. Actually, not everybody's sort of been hurt by um, labour rates going up. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, another one in the um, sort of consumer sector is Inspects, which has been a sort of like in a turnaround mode for quite some time. I think it was listed about three years ago. And then uh, it, during 2022, it came out with a profit warning and then started turning itself around. And then actually, unfortunately, had another profit warning. I think just before Christmas, it saw a bit of a, a bit of a slowdown in December, I think. What, what's your latest on this one? Because it just seemed to be not quite hitting the ball out of the park. In- it's not. It's not hitting the ball out of the park, but it's... Um... I think because it's dropped below certain market cap levels, it's it's too lowly valued. So it's got about 200 million of revenue, perhaps a bit more, 50% yeah. gross margin. Um, it floated with 10 million of EBITDA, acquired a business with 10 million of EBITDA. And the forecast, you're right, is still to only do the 20 million of EBITDA. They were as high as 32 at one point. I think it's been hit by, you know, consumer appetite in Germany, places like that. Um, they launched a little um, lens manufacturer. They bought one out of administration and it needed improving and it, that, that execution there wasn't perfect. But in recent meetings we've had with them, um, the December profit warning was there's some timing issues, but I, but I think this year should be okay. Um, but the share price, of, you know, the value is about 51 million on the business, 200 million of revenue. 100 million of gross margin you know when everybody was in love with it it was valued at four quid um at some point the consumer appetite will turn up there is a bit of debt of about 20 million but the EBITDA is about 20 million it's, it's certainly manageable it feels more about the investors selling because it's dropped below 100 million than it does about this this is terrible execution and I understand that an independent valuation of the US business, which is 25% of revenue, is is about the market cap. So, um, you know, there are other similar businesses. There's, there's frame manufacturers in Vietnam, and mm-hmm. um, the lens business in the UK. And actually, uh, of, of some interest, if you look at the last full report accounts in 2022 and other 2023 year ones yet, there is. Um, a development project with Bosch, I think it's called Bosch Sensor Tech for, for sort of funky X-ray specs time type innovative products, um, which certainly they've only had cost to date. But um, you know, when you look in the report accounts, it said that was due for launch in 2024, and uh, potentially that's putting quite good volume and margin through the lens and the frame manufacturing business. So maybe there's some upside there, but I mean, it's if they don't manage it and the price doesn't go up i would imagine it won't be on the market much longer mm. do, they somebody own, do they own their own the brands or the any ip at all or is it all based they, own, they own some trade brands in, in germany they license in the brands from people like caterpillar and right. ted bacon things like that but they they have german trade brands into the opticians there's one called humphreys and there's another one whose name escapes me just right now, but okay. you know they, they have reasonable market share and they tend to be brands that people might trade down to in, in more difficult markets. Okay, good. Okay, that's well, one to watch, definitely. We've got um, also now to move to XP Factory, which came out, uh, I think it was results last week, which were very good on the sort of top line, uh, sort of double-digit growth. And I think it's just reaching sort of profitability now um at the uh at the pbt level or sort of on underlying basis or the or the operating profit so it seems to have reached a bit of a tipping point it owns uh boom battle bars but more importantly also the um uh, escape uh, room uh concept as well in yeah. the uk so experience you'll have a, take us through this one because you know it's it's reached it's say this it seems to have just reached a level of sort of like you know profitability yeah so they were actually pretty good results i mean i think they beat various expectations they put out there at various parts of last year. They'd originally raised money at 30p, um, I think two or three years ago, and they had a tall order to launch 20 of these boom battle bars, and they, they actually did it. Um, at, at various parts, points, of course, things like 
COVID and stuff, there may have been some disappointments, but but actually um, when we look at the results, the top line was better. And there was, I think it was 9 million of cash generation. Well, the market cap mm. is 25. Um, and I see some comment about depreciation. Well, you've always got to be careful about that, but I think the maintenance capex is sort of saying is 1 million, even if you said it's two, then, um, you know, there is a lot of cash coming off it. So I guess if they were 30p, which is what they raised the money at rather than today's 14, mm. you probably have a free cash flow yield up towards mid-teens, I would guess, 15, 20%. So there isn't a particularly aggressive rollout uh, plan for this year. They might open three or four, I think, um, possibly buying some franchisees. But you will get the, the run rate effect of, um, of of the sites being open for longer. So it just feels like it's the wrong level, really. Again, um, perhaps the struggle here is that it's 25 million and mm. people don't want to own stuff that's 25 million, even if it maybe should be worth 50. Yeah. And then just broadly with the health of the consumer, I mean, you've got the sort of like energy bills reducing from the 1st of April, which is about, I don't know, 15% they're coming off, which is great news for everybody, thank God. And then we've also got um, the national living wage as well, which is going to hopefully boost people's real incomes with inflation coming down. What's sort of like your view of the health of the sort of the working consumer rather than per person? Obviously on benefits, it's still going to be really tough. Yeah, well, I mean, the old age pensions has gone up, um, minimum wage has gone up. Um, I think for people that are capital constrained, gas prices have come down. It's less of an issue. You're right, things like national insurance are going. Um, I think the gas price may have been a problem for people on lower incomes, whereas I think what's been happening since October of last year is there's been maybe a problem for people on on sort of families around the m25 just around the m25 where you've got the reversion of mortgages on variable rates so it's quite common to hear of people whose interest rates uh interest payments have doubled yeah and that's probably likely to be um with higher house prices down by the m25 that kind of area um now potentially that's a problem for, for some discretionary purchase. So, I don't know, people putting in new patios or new kitchens and th those kind of things, they, they will defer those. But but you're right, people are buying, hot, they're still doing the family holiday. So, so the, the, the consumer, the trends may, may well have changed quite a lot, but a third of people rent property, a third of people have already bought the house and paid off the mortgage. And a, a, and a third are with a mortgage of which 85% have got these... Um, fixed rate mortgages because of course when the fixed rate comes to the end of its term then they will revert to um the variable rate mm -hmm. and so yeah i think i think possibly we will see a couple of interest rate cuts by the end of the year i think that's the expectation and the government of the bank of england was suggesting that's possible and i think that's driven by inflation coming down so so hopefully that will be a, a, a quite positive for the a small cap environment you usually when rates come down it's it's a great environment for small companies and uk domestics yeah yeah i think it also if the employment market still says you know up, oh, then it, it gives people access to money in terms of if they want to work then they can uh, they can get a reasonably well-paid job to cover bills so well, they well, can it, work extra it does i mean rates were put up because demand in some respect to some extent was too high yeah and you know there are a shortage of getting people for low paid jobs as you know and minimum wage is kind of going up to, you're close to 10 percent and was similar last year as well so some of the people on lower incomes may well be doing better particularly if things like gas prices and food price inflation abate somewhat yeah well we've just had a uh we've just sort of like done a few things on our kitchen and uh we've struggled getting people still so uh yeah, there's definitely jobs around. Okay, well, let's move to the final one. We've got uh, Zigona Com Communications, which I've never, ever come across. So well-spotted. It's actually a pretty big 1.8 uh, billion euro business, but it is listed on the UK. That's in you know in, in pounds sterling. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's started by a couple of guys who came from the telco, wireless telco world, maybe Liberty or something like that, or Virgin or something. And they're just, yeah. and, and just going through a transaction 
to buy the old Vodafone Spain business. Can you take us through what's piqued your interest here? Because they seem to be taking on a lot of debt. They've just raised a bit of money at 150 to help yeah. fund that. Um, but uh, what, what's interested you on the, the, the effectively Vodafone Spain wireless business? I think it was very um, undermanaged. I think it was run like a, you know, it was a big multi-billion pound company, which it was, but it, there was, wasn't too much optimization around um, telecoms. It had 1.3 billion, has 1.3 billion euros of EBITDA, but only 400 million of cash conversion. And I came across these two guys, Zagona, when they bought a couple of regional uh, assets, uh, Telecabla. I mean, they, 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 they and uh, Uskaltar was the other one. And they eventually they did a deal and they sold those, but they had minority stakes initially, which made it difficult for them to really get in and change the operating model. Whereas with Vodafone Spain, there is huge scope. And they, they've talked about taking 400 million of cash flow up towards 700 million. And there are precedents for deals where you carve out the infrastructure piece, which is the the monthly rentals. So this was done but with um, a company called Digi in Spain and KKR. I've done it with Telecom Italia, where you sell the network and uh, potentially they could sell that two to three billion. Um, and then, of course, obviously you have to pay them some money, but you tend to get kind of 15 times EBITDA for those sales. Right. Maybe they'll get 12 to 15 times. And they bought it on four times. So there's there's a pretty big arbitrage there. And as I say, I came across these two guys and in industry checks we've done. They are quite aggressive cost cutters. Uh, that's Eamon O'Hare and um, Robert Samuelson, um, I think, is pretty good at doing the deals to, for wholesale deals. So there's, there's a pretty long list of um, benefits that they might be able to get from either cost cutting, spending less on IT, um, and, and deals around the network. Mm. Well, where do you get growth in what in broadband nowadays? Though that's the, in the, in a developed market. That in my head, as in like they, you know, they're priced as effectively quasi bonds. Yeah, but I think I think I think the growth from this one would be to get four hundred million of free cash flow up towards seven hundred. So by just cutting some of the costs, so they okay. so a lot of the metrics are yeah. just really low compared yeah, to right. indus, industry comparators, mm. and I'm sure they will put some try and put some growth in as well. But the problem is with everybody competing with everybody else, you, growth comes at a cost, whereas taking the costs out, is, I, I think it wasn't a core asset for Vodafone. Yeah, okay. And a bit like the Capita software piece we're talking about, um, you know, when something gets in the hands of somebody that's very focused on it, then um, it can improve quite aggressively. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I was looking at the margins, actually. It's less than 25% EBITDA margins compared to Telefonica, which is the BT equivalent, which isn't massively efficient, and they're on 35. So, uh, yeah, yeah. There, must be, there must be something there. Okay, I just I, there was a couple of others, actually. I just forgot to do uh, enter the spectrum in terms of success. We've got uh, Beaks Financial, and we've also got Made Tech. Now, Beaks Financial basically does... Uh, sort of low latency uh, connectivity for um, exchanges and for fund managers around the world. And it's got a big contract, actually, which has just been extended with the Johanna Stock, uh, Stock Exchange. Can you take us through this one? Because, I mean, it, it really has taken off this year, actually, that those shares. Yeah, I, th I think it's been a long time coming. It started off with two or three million in revenue, and it's up towards 25. It's been growing at 25 to 30%, but it's highly recurrent revenue, yeah. and they are able to get inflationary price increases. But um, as I say, really high retention of clients. So you start next year knowing pretty much where you are. It's only about 120 million market cap. But uh, the, perhaps the biggest problem with the business is that shares are up a lot. So people are loath to buy them. But um, I think it's valued about seven times next year's EBITDA. I understand the comps in the US trade on 12 to 15 times historic. So if they can grow... As as their forecast to do, there's no reason why they shouldn't. Then then there's really pretty good upside there. But in February they had a positive trading statement about such as the Johannesburg Stock Exchange doing better than expected. And they also announced, which is not in the numbers, a major exchange, probably we believe substantially bigger than Johannesburg Stock Exchange, that they have signed and are on the, in the premises with. 
but which is subject to regulatory clearance. So we don't know exactly when that would come, but potentially that might add 50 to 100 percent to the to the EBITDAs that are out there. Wow. So you've got something that's valued quite lowly, that's quite dependent with this inflationary pricing. It's taken a long time to get here. I think there are some quite clear M&A metrics. So certainly, I think the management we're talking to, Paul Scott, I think you know. Yeah. And, and there's quite a good um, video on the internet about that. It's worth a look. So it just, it just seems like it's sort of very dependable. It's smaller than than most big institutions are happy investing in 120 million, but it has all the right sort of characteristics. So if it grows a bit, which it looks likely to do, should come onto a lot more investors' radars. Yeah, this one this one does seem like um, run your winners on this, even though it's popped up a lot. And then the other side is is Made Tech, which basically just it's an IT services business, is supporting largely the UK public sector. It was listed, I think, twenty twenty one. Unfortunately, has, has struggled a bit and came out with a uh, a trading update just recently, saying that or it's half year results, saying that uh, it was it was still in line, but heading into the general election, it may start seeing yeah. some softness and it, and its sales cycles were increasing, which is actually not a surprise, to be honest. Yeah, it closed at one pound forty. The shares are, I think, they're nine pence. Yeah. Um, it's it's really quite small, so maybe yeah. the last one we mentioned, but um, it's quite well liked by its customers, gets reasonable references from people that work there, it checks out pretty well. You're paying about three or four million for the services business. It's done kind of 40 million in revenues. It might go as low as 30 million, it might do, but it's, as I say, it's got seven or eight million of cash. New finance director in here, who's I was pretty impressed with. I think it's very much about delivering what he says he will, controlling the cash. Even if you put it on half revenues, which is pretty low for an IT service business, and, and assume 30 million, you, you're probably up towards 18 or 20p, including yeah, the cash. Yeah. But if you then assume that actually it might get back to growth, which I think it potentially can do, and it was certainly on a growth trajectory when it floated, but... Um, you know, you'd, you'd be pushing higher metrics. You'd be pushing. You might be thinking about forty million of revenue and once once turnover plus the cash. You know, you two or three times the price. In hindsight, it'll be obvious that it was cheap now. But you know, you'd, there's a bit of waiting required. Very cheap, but um, you probably need the the cycle to pick up. I suppose management who own two of them, the founders own about forty percent of it. They might take it private, but I, I think they'd struggle to. Get a recommendation from the board at you know within 100 percent of today's price yeah yeah I, I could certainly see it being taken out by somebody because you'd this is a sort of like a nice little bolt on for people isn't it you know for the bigger players in this it space yeah it is but it's a people business and you as i say you've got 40 percent of the management yeah who'd have to sort of go with that yeah no, but, well, yeah I, I think it's a good example because there's quite a lot of real businesses that have had a difficult year that it that are trading too low to be bought because the price is just yeah the management involved would, would just would not sell within a hundred percent of today's price and there's there's quite a lot of those sort of businesses out there mm. yeah uh, and, you do, and and given the liquidity I don't know what it's like but I guess it's not that that great and therefore <clears throat> it's just dropped out on sort of low liquidity it won't take much of a following win to to move it up as well I think there is a buyer out there actually um. I think they buy them on off days. And I'm sure there's people who just don't want to own things of that size that will readily sell them. But you, what you find at the bottom of the market, and I think we're bumping along the bottom, is that um, sometimes it's just the one seller out there. You, the price goes down to a level and doesn't take much money to clear out the overhang of stock and then up, up they go to, to the proper valuation. Okay, well, that's a good place to uh, to finish it on. And sort of an optimistic note in terms of, you know, just just looking forward. Then in, it, I know we talked about in in the small cap sector, just something that investors shouldn't do at these levels. And which I'm guessing, given you both, we're both pretty optimistic. <laughs> you shouldn't be bailing out at these levels if they're good, solid businesses. Just stick with it. Well, the pro the problem is, of course, is performance is, has not been great in the whole small and micro cap sector. So we're, yeah. we're sort of looking backwards, but looking forwards, the big winners come from sell offs like this. So 2020, 2008, 2009 were great times. Even 98, 99 were fabulous times to get involved so you do find that in hindsight it's obvious there's always an excuse why you wouldn't buy it or there's an overhang there's a seller there 
but actually when something's really cheap and it looks like it's you know if you're the bottom of the cycle and small caps they're about at, you know statistics tell you now they should be pretty good particularly when the rates come down um you do have to buy them at some point yeah here's a here's an optimistic uh scenario and this is uh, a bit in uh, in april with the um, energy going down, we'll see a CPI less than 2% in mm. the UK. And then in June, the Bank of England will reduce interest rates by a half a percentage point. What about that? Would that, would that be a bit of a rocket boost of a small cap? It would help. It would help. It all helps. Yeah. And I think it would help people do the deals as well because, you know, private equity, people buying businesses have to finance them. If it's, if it's a bit cheaper, they're getting a business that, well, they pay a little bit less to finance it. And if the environments are just a bit easing up a bit, I think that will encourage people in. Brilliant. Okay, well, fascinating as always there, uh, Richard. And if somebody wants to buy um, some you know, some, some shares or invest in uh, the Crux Asset Management portfolio, how best to do that? Yeah, well, on your usual platforms, all the companies mentioned here today are on the Crux UK Smaller Companies Fund. Uh, most of them are on the Crux UK Special Situations, which has some bigger, more grown-up companies as well. But, um, but yeah, it's available from all good platforms. Uh, TM Crux UK Smaller Companies Fund and the TM Crux UK Special Sit. Brilliant. Okay, well, thanks again and uh, look forward in touching base after the summer sometime mid-autumn uh, when hopefully we'll have seen a rally in small caps. Wait, I hope so. Should be. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. 